so good morning to everybody let us start the class <clears throat> okay now let's uh, normally we talked about uh, last class about the pituitary gland and its role how is it regulated now the pituitary gland is under the control of hypothalamus now the adenohypophysis what we have secretes six hormones this area secretes six hormones these six hormone secretion are controlled by that is what we have the secretions from the hypothalamus though pituitary gland is a master gland its secretion is controlled by hypothalamus now the hypothalamus actually we have some nucleus is there what we have the neurons in the ventral hypothalamus neurons in the ventral hypothalamus there are some secretions these secretions normally may be uh, an accelerating factor what is called the releasing factor or an inhibiting factor so for every hormone of adrenohypophysis one releasing factor one inhibiting factor so this is being secreted by what we have the neuro that is the uh, and the neuronal cells of hypothalamus they are being transported through the circulatory system now these are all the axons which ends in normally the end in what we have the blood capillaries this is a connection between the blood capillary connection between the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland with anti pituitary gland and this is called hypothalamus hypophysal portal system hypothalamus hypophysal portal system so the releasing factors are inhibiting factors for every hormone being transported through hypothalamus this is what we have the hypothalamus and hypophysal portal system whereas the secretions of neurohypophysis what i mentioned normally they are not secreting the actually the cells of neurohypophysis never secrete any hormones but they are being secreted by two different nuclei a collection of nerve cells one is called supra optic nucleus another one paraventricular nucleus the supra optic nucleus normally secretes what is called of sorry vasopressin or what we have adh you see that one and this is what we have supra optic nuclei and then the paraventricular nuclei just normally secrete what we have the hormone oxytocin so these two hormones are secreted by hypothalamus not by the neurohypophysis they are being normally transported through what we have the axons through the axons okay now these axons carry the hormones to hormone that's why they call us neurohormones secreted by the nervous tissue So oxytocin and ADH or vasopressin are called as neurohormones as they are secreted by the hypothalamus of the pituitary gland. Now, what are the functions we see now already just after that level? The role of uh, oxytocin. Let's go for the functions of vasopressin. So it is otherwise called as anti-diuretic hormone. Why? Right. So the name vasopressin is given because it causes a constriction of blood vessels, thereby increasing the BP. Hence, called vasopressin. it is also called anti diuretic hormone what is diuresis what is diuresis what is diuresis so we have diuresis means elimination of large volume of diluted urine elimination of large volume of diluted urine that is called diuresis now this hormone is normally promoting the reabsorption of water by the kidney tubules thereby just excreting small amount of urine there is a elimination of scanty concentrated urine that process is called anti diuresis promoting the reabsorption and then that results in the elimination of what we call concentrated urine there is very small amount of urine that process is called anti diuresis diuresis elimination of diluted urine large amount anti diuresis means elimination of what is called concentrated scanty urine there is not much amount of urine but only small amount of urine so that's why it's called as the main reason is it promotes the reabsorption of water by the kidney tubules that by retaining the water content in the body but this secretion of this adh is normally under the control of certain osmoreceptor cells of the hypothalamus the secretion of this hormone is normally being done according to the osmotic concentration of the blood and the level of water in the blood is less this hormone is secreted more so that it stimulates what we call the seminif sorry the uniferous tubules to reabsorb water suppose if the amount of water is more in the blood its secretion is normally suppressed so that more water is eliminated so 
Its secretion depends on the osmotic concentration of what we have in the blood. That is, it depends on that is nothing that depends on the volume or the concentration of water in the blood being detected by what we call the osmoreceptor cells of the hypothalamus. Normally, it promotes the reabsorption of water mainly by what we call the tubules, the collecting tubules of nephron, the collecting tubules of nephron. In all other parts, water being reabsorbed simply by means of the epithelial cells, but there only in the collecting tubule of nephron, the water reabsorption is brought about by mainly this hormone. Okay, it promotes what is called antidiuresis. That means reabsorption of more water and elimination of concentrated urine, hence called antidiuretic hormone. So that is why just I mentioned about here the point. It acts mainly on the kidney and stimulates the reabsorption of water and electrolytes. Not only water but also the electrolytes from the distal tubules and the way it reduces the loss of water through the urine. So distal tubules as well as what we call the collecting tubules. In both the places, the reabsorption takes place because of what they have this hormone. Now, it causes, I mentioned, why always it causes what we have vasopressin, constriction of blood vessel, thereby increasing the blood pressure. Now, what will happen? So, this hormone is also not only just absorption of water, but also we have the electrolytes as well as urea. Certain amount of urea is also being reabsorbed because urea is one of the components responsible for maintaining osmotic pressure of the blood along with albumin and sodium. Along with albumin and sodium. So the osmotic pressure of blood depends on the amount of albumin, the amount of sodium, and also the amount of urea. These are all the three factors: urea, albumin, and sodium responsible for maintaining the osmotic pressure. Now, what is the deficiency disorder cause? Now, the deficiency disorder cause is diabetes insipidus. When there is deficiency of hormone, what will happen is that when the disease occurs. So, the synthesis release of results and diminish. So, an impairment, if there is an impairment of that what we have the part, then what will happen? There is a result of diminished amount of what is called this hormone. And this hormone, so what will happen? This will not actually allow the water to be reabsorbed and promotes the elimination of water. That condition is called diabetes insipidus. So it is different from diabetes mellitus. In diabetes mellitus, normally the sugar is eliminated. There we have three symptoms. One question also becomes a person feeling thirst consumes large amount of water, excretes large amount of urine, but his blood sugar level is normal. And that is what we have diabetes insipidus. But in the case of diabetes mellitus, what we have? So a person feeling thirst consumes more water, consumes more food, ex excretes large volume of water, excretes large volume of water means urine, and also is having blood sugar level more in the blood. But there is no increase in blood sugar level in the case of diabetes insipidus. And also we have two symptoms only, not three symptoms. So, symptom number one, polyuria. It is common to both the diabetes mellitus and this one, diabetes insipidus. Okay, the sugar level is normal in the case of diabetes insipidus, unlike what we have diabetes mellitus, where you have sugar level is more. But here, it is otherwise called tasteless urine. Tasteless urine. That means urine without sugar. And the diabetes mellitus, urine with the sugar. Now, polyuria, excretion of large volume of urine. Then, polydipsia. So, excessive thirst leading to increased consumption of water. These are the two symptoms. But there is one more symptom in the case of diabetes mellitus, what is called polyphagia. This symptom is not found here. Polyphagia. A person feels always hungry, eating excessively, and that is called polyphagia, as in the case of uh, diabetes mellitus. But this symptom is absent in the case of, that is, uh, diabetes insipidus. Now these are all the functions. So it is called as a child with hormone. Its main function is stimulating. I mentioned about all these functions. Okay, let's compare this one. Now the next one, pineal gland, otherwise called as epiphysis. Now the dorsal part of what we call diencephala. Normally the diencephala is being divided into three parts: epithalamus, thalamus, and hypothalamus. Pituitary gland is connected to the hypothalamus. Now the pineal body epiphysis is connected to the epithalamus, the upper part of what is called diencephalon. Now where is it present? Now it is I mentioned about 
It's a stalked small rounded gland located on the dorsal side of the forebrain at the top of what is called the third ventricle. At the top of the third ventricle, that's a diencephalon. It is nothing but a part of the diencephalon body. Otherwise, called as epiphysis, the upper part. Now, what are the hormones secreted? There is only one hormone secreted, namely melatonin. So, one question also melatonin is <coughs> what is the basic substance for the formation of melatonin? This melatonin is formed from an amino acid, what is called actually tryptophan. This is one question came in the question paper tryptophan. Tryptophan. So, melatonin is formed from tryptophan and amino acid. So, this is the question, remember that one. The source for melatonin, tryptophan and amino acid. This is an amino acid. Now this is the location what we have, this is what we have the pineal gland, you see that one. So that part we have the thalamus, hypothalamus, but it all here you can find it. The duct, the fourth ventricle, the choroid plexus, then also the cerebellum, all these things you can have. The arbor, vitae, you see that one, the branch the structure, that is also seen here. Okay, now let's go for that one. Now what are the functions of melatonin? Now it is concerned with easy that one diurnal rhythm that is also called a circadian rhythm concerned with the sleep wake up cycle. How long you can sleep, how long you can wake up. That is called sleep wake up cycle that is by means of this melatonin hormone along with hypothalamus. Along with the hypothalamus also it controls and regulates the body temperature. And also it influences along with this one, just controlling the diurnal rhythm, day and the night cycle. It also influences metabolism. As the name implies, it is responsible for the dispersal of the melanin pigment on the surface of the skin, that is pigmentation. So particularly its concentration, the pigmentation of the skin is more concentrated in some specific areas, for example, in the case of female in the mammary gland, areola region, and also in the case of male scrotal size. So, these areas are more dark in color. This is because of the dispersal of the melanin pigment brought about by what we call the hormone, that is melatonin. Then also it regulates menstrual cycle. In the case of female, if this hormone is not secreted properly, they have abnormal menstrual cycle. And also giving the defense ability against what we call the various structures. Now, thyroid gland. Now, it is composed of two loops. So normally if you are taking thyroid gland, it is formed of two lobes. Then each lobe is made up of lobules and each lobule is formed of what is called the follicles or acidity. This is the arrangement. Gland, two lobes, lobules and then what we call follicles or acid. Now what is the location? I mentioned about it is formed of two lobes and located one on either side of the trachea just below the level of the larynx. This is the area where we have the gland is formed. The two lobes are normally joined by means of what is called a glandular tissue. Anteriorly, it is normally joined by means of glandular tissue, what is called eyemus or isthmus. Now, the thyroid gland is formed of, I mentioned already, it is formed of what is called lobules. The lobules are formed of follicles and what we call the connecting tissues, the interfollicular tissues called the stromal tissue, stroma, the body. The follicles surrounded by stroma. I'll show the picture. Stoma and then stromal tissues and then follicles. Now, each thyroid follicle is normally lined with a single layer of cuboidal epithelium. Now, each one is normally lined with a single layer of cuboidal epithelium. There is one question. Remember that one. So, I must one question, another one cuboidal epithelium. That is, each follicle is lined with a single layer of cuboidal epithelium. See that one, the location. Now this is the thyroid gland. So there is also one question regarding that one. The gland which is butterfly shaped. The gland which is butterfly shaped. You see that one the gland is more or less butterfly shaped. Formed of two lobes and a narrow anterior bridge what we have eyes. Narrow anterior bridge what is called eyes. So thyroid and then it is present on either side of the trachea. A narrow anterior bridge connects the two lobes. Okay. It is butterfly shaped gland. Butterfly shaped gland. Now this is what the section I mentioned about. So this is what we can say the thyroid follicle. The thyroid follicle, you see that one, this is a follicle. Many follicles are present. Now these are all the stromal tissues, interfollicular tissues. We have interfollicular tissues and blood vessels. 
endophollicular tissues and then small blood capillaries. Now, each follicle is that one lined with what we have, that is a cells. The cells are in the form of cuboidal epithelium. Now, each follicle encloses a colloid. So, the hormone secreted by this gland is thyroxine. Thyroxine never present as thyroxine. It is always in combination with one protein, what is called globally. So it is never present ideally. It is normally always in combination with the protein globulin as thyroglobulin. The thyroglobulin is called as colloid. Whenever there is a need, only the hormone is separated from the protein and released into the bloodstream to do the activity. Now what is the name of the hormone secret? Now, the follicular cells, otherwise called acidity, they secrete what is called tetrahydrothyronine, otherwise called as thyroxine. This is a functional hormone, the functional thyroxine hormone is called tetrahydrothyronine. And also, we have trihydrothyronine. When compared to trihydrothyronine, just a tetrahydrothyronine is considered as a thyroxine hormone. So, having four organic iodides connected to what we call what is called the hormone is made up of an amino acid tyrosine. Tyrosine. So this hormone is nothing but an iodinated form of amino acid tyrosine. Iodinated form of amino acid tyrosine. In that hormone, nearly 65% is formed of iodine and 35% is formed of what is called tyrosine. 65% is formed of iodine and 35% is formed of what is called that is tyrosine, the amino acid, to form what is called the thyroxine hormone. Tetrahydrothyronine is the chemical nature because it contains four organic iodides connected to, uh, connected to what we have in the different places of the tyrosine amino acid. Now, what are the functions of thyroxine? Now, this is normally a hormone concerned with the nervous system and skeletal system. This hormone is needed at the time of what is called childhood. The hormone normally stimulates the development of nervous system along with actually skeletal system but the most important function is nothing but actually to promote the development of nervous system at the time of birth. Now this is the nature of the hormone what I mentioned, thyroxine T4, now this is the amino acid tyrosine. So to first it forms what is called diiodothyronine, diiodothyronine, so it is normally called 3, 5, 3 dash, 5 dash. Tetrahydrothyronine, 3.3-5-dash tetrahydrothyronine. Now this is a this is a normal one, a tyrosine amino acid. So during the union of actually first formation monohydrothyronine, diiodothyronine, and then two diiodothyronine di molecules join together to form what is called tetrahydrothyronine. So this is a skeleton of what we call thyroxine hormone, and this one is what we call triiodothyronine. Three. 5, 3 dash. This is what we call 3 dash. Now this is 3, 5 and this is what is called 3 dash. And this one is the fifth position. So 3, 5 actually there is 3 dash, 5 dash. That is the location of the, that is iodine, which later converted to organic iodine. So that's about the skeleton of, see that one in the picture, tetrahydrothyronine. The normal name for this one, the commercial name, thyroxine horn. Now it regulates iodine and sugar level in the blood. Because it's an iodinated hormone, it regulates the sugar level and iodine. So, along with, for example, this glucohorn, it's also responsible for increasing the sugar level. So, all the other hormones, excepting insulin, other hormones are normally just a hyperglycemic hormone, excepting insulin. It's the only hormone decreases the blood sugar level. All other hormones are working against insulin. That's why the problem we have developed what is called diabetes mellitus. Now, it is called as a pace setter. The gland is also called as a pace setter because it increases the rate of basal metabolism. What we call BMR increases the basal metabolic rate. Basal metabolic rate. Once the basal metabolic rate increases, ultimately the amount of heat produced from the oxidation process increases. That's why the body temperature is also increases. So a person with more thyroxine secretion normally has higher body temperature and also emotional. Okay. Now. It also controls the metabolism of carbohydrates, proteins and fats and maintains the water and electrolyte balance. Normally, it reduces the serum cholesterol level. The serum cholesterol level is normally reduced by this one. Okay, I have given here. It reduces the serum cholesterol level. When this hormone is absent, ultimately the cholesterol level increases. 
Then for efficient muscle contraction, we need this thyroxin hormone to break down glycogen in the muscle. For breaking down glycogen in the muscle, it is essential. So that only we can have what is called normal muscle contraction. Now as it is responsible for the growth of the body, physical growth of the body indirectly, this is what is called personality hormone. And also called as calorific hormone. It's also called calorific hormone. Calorific because it increases the rate of metabolism and produces more heat in the body. That is why it's called as calorific hormone or personality hormone. Okay. Now thyroid disorders. When the secretion of the thyroid gland is less, a person develops what is called a condition hypothyroidism. So the physiological effects due to the deficiency of thyroxin hormone is called hypothyroidism. Now it is being manifested by means of three different disorders. Number one, simple goit. It is due to the deficiency of iodine in the diet, not thyroxine, iodine in the diet. So we need normally 10 micrograms of iodine per day. 10 micrograms of iodine per day. If the level of iodine is less in the diet, what we have? So the secretion of thyroxine is impaired. So inadequate amount of what is called iodine results in what is called a goiter. Simply we can say simple void. When the iodine content is less in the blood, so what is happening or in the diet, so what is happening, the secretion of thyroxine is impact. But the hypertrophy of thyroid gland occurs. Hypertrophy means increased activity of thyroid gland without raw materials. So without raw materials like iodine, what will happen? The glandular tissues are replaced by what we have, the fibrous tissues of the gland. So the gland enlarges to enormous proportion. That is called as a simple void. The simple goit is due to the deficiency of iodine and increase in the enormous growth of what is called the gland due to the hypertrophy, increased activity without raw materials. Now, the simple goit is more common in areas where we have the iodine content is less in the soil as it is localized in specific places, for example, near mountain areas where the iodine content is less in the soil. It is also called as endemic goit restricted to only specific regions. You see that one, this is what's called simple goiter, the enlargement of the gland to enormous proportion because of the absence of iodine in the diet. The normal iodine that is needed per day is about 10 microgram. If it is less than 10 microgram, then the person has developed. Now another deficiency because of less secretion, mixed edema, that is in the case of adults. As it was reported by Gull, it is called Gull's disease. Now what are the symptoms? So when the secretion is low, so we have low metabolic rate. Normally in the case of these persons, what we have the accumulation of fluid in the face, that is called myxedema. Myxedema is good, hence the name myxedema. Edema means accumulation of fluid. As the fluid accumulation is restricted only to the face region, this is called myxedema. Now low metabolic rate, one of the major symptoms, puffy bloated face, that's what I mentioned, edematic condition in the face, accumulation of more water, so the face becomes puffy. And then the skin becomes dry, the hands become dry, all these conditions are being hoarse voice, normally these persons are actually slow speech, poor thought, so poor memory, poor thought, all being happened because of what we have, there is decreased secretion of thyroxine in the case of under. The skin becomes dry. You see that one. This is one picture showing. Now you see that one accumulation of fluid. <coughs> <coughs> this is at the time of disease. Then this is after curing. The person, you see that one, the puffy face has been reduced because of the treatment. So this is the picture showing the comparison. Myxedema after treatment. So one of the major symptoms I mentioned here, accumulation of fluid in the face, and that is called myxedematous fluid. Hence the disease is called myxedema. Now the third disorder which is called because of the deficiency of thyroxine in the case of children at the time of birth. So what we have as a result, the growth of the skeleton is affected, the growth of the nervous system is affected, so they are mentally retarded, short stage, and even the pond belly. Now we see that one it is found in children who are deficient of thyroxine hormone from the time of birth or during pregnancy. So it started even during the pregnancy itself. Now I mentioned earlier mental retardation. Then low intelligence quotient. So we can calculate the intelligence quotient by calculating what is called the mental age, then also by using chronological age. So chronological age is divided by the mental age multiplied by 100, you can get what is called the IQ. So the low intelligence quotient, low IQ, 
do of stage because of the stunted growth because the bones are not developed properly then protruding tongue so the protruding tongue condition is called macroglossia i will show the picture macroglossia the child's tongue is always projecting out and that is called protruding tongue low base metabolically again arrest of pubertal sexual maturity they never attain puberty they do not develop secondary sexual characters abnormal skin deaf mutism Deaf mutism means unable to hear the voices normally, and in the case of female, if this hormone is normally deficient, what will happen? There is improper, irregular menstrual cycle in the case of female. Now you see that one macroglossia condition, macroglossia condition. There is nothing but the protrusion or the projection of the tongue. The child's tongue is always projecting out. That is a condition seen in the case of cretinism, short stature body. You see that one mental retardation. The child never attain puberty and do not develop secondary sexual characters. Now the over secretion of thyroxine hormone results in a condition what is called hyperparathyroidism. It leads to thyrotoxicosis, or ophthalmic goiter, and Graves' disease. All are having the same one. So the, after the name of the person, it is called Graves' disease, and we have ex ophthalmic goiter. So two symptoms. The eyeballs are protruding out, and also enlargement of the gland. Both the symptoms are available, and that's why it's called exophthalmic goiter. Swelling of gland along with protrusion of eyeball. Exophthalmic condition. That's called exophthalmic condition. Now it is a due to maybe for example when the cancer occurs in the thyroid gland, the secretion is normally increased, or due to what we call the development of nodules of the thyroid. Either because of cancer or because of what we call the nodules in thyroid gland, ultimate result what we call hyper parathyroidism, leading to thyrotoxicosis. So it is also thyrotoxicosis is also increases the rate of heartbeat, leading to what is called angina pectoris, the chest pain. This is because of what is called thyroxine hormone. One of the reasons for angina pectoris, a disorder, chest pain. Is due to what is called over secretion of thyroxine hormone, or we can say thyrotoxicosis. Now, all are increased: increased basal metabolic rate, increased what is called pulmonary ventilation, increased heartbeat rate, increased glucose level, all being increased here. Okay, so increased basal metabolic rate, increased heartbeat rate, increased blood glucose, and also increased pulmonary ventilation. Nothing but the breathing. Okay, and also along with enlargement of the glands. And additionally, we have the protrusion of the eyeballs, and that is called exophthalmos. So, enlargement and exophthalmos two conditions. What we have two symptoms. That is why it is called as exophthalmic goiter. Both the protrusion of eyeballs plus enlargement. So, the nervousness in the case of these people, there is a weight loss because of increased oxidation of food materials, and also the persons are always emotional instability, emotionally instable. They are un unable to what is called cope with the environment. They become just angry because of the over secretion. That is called emotional instability. There is no stability in the case of emotion. They cannot control their emotions. That is called emotional instability. Now this is what we call the ophthalm. That is what is called Graves' ophthalm ophthalmopathy. So any word ending with pathy is referring to the disorder. Ophthalmopathy here referring. Eyeball. You see, one of the eyeballs, protrusion of the eyeballs. Can not both one eyeball is being protruded. Along with you see that one, the enlargement of the gland just low. It is not seen in the picture, and that is why it is called as Graves' ophthalmopathy, protrusion of the eyeballs. Hence, called as ophthalmic void. Now, in addition to this thyroxin, between the thyroid follicles, what I mentioned, we have what is called parafollicular tissue. There is a, outside the follicle we have parafollicular tissue, which is secretes another hormone, what is called thyrocalcitonin or what is called TCT. So TCT is normally not secreted with the parathyroid gland, as mentioned in some books. It is secreted mainly with the parafollicular cells. The cells which are present outside the follicle respond for the secretion of what is called the hormone, and that is calcitonin, thyrocalcitonin. Okay. So it is not an iodinated form. It is a non-iodinated form of hormone. It is a protein. It is a protein hormone, just like what is called LTH, ACTH. It is a protein hormone. Now, so it is a calcium-lowering hormone. That's why it's called as hypocalcemic hormone. 
This is a hypocalcemic protein horn. Hypocalcemic. And also hypophosphatemic. Hypophosphate. Phosphatemic. Because it decreases the calcium level as well as what we call that is a phosphate level in the plasma or in the blood. Hence called hypocalcemic hormone or hypophosphatemic hormone. That's why I mentioned about it is a calcium lowering hormone. Now what is this along with what you see that one that is along with another hormone of parathyroid, parathormone. It regulates the calcium level of the blood. It regulates the calcium level of the blood. Now, it regulates plasma calcium by inhibiting bone breakdown. Doesn't allow the bone to undergo what is called the breakdown. That's what is called the demineralization. It prevents demineralization. So, parathormone promotes demineralization. That's why calcium is released from the bones. But this one prevents or inhibits what is called the bone breakdown. There is nothing but demineralization. There is no removal of calcium from the bones. That's why there is no increase in calcium level. So it is, I mentioned about hypocalcemic and hypophosphatemic hormone as it decreases the calcium level and phosphate level in the blood. So I mentioned about along with parathormone, PTH, this is what is called TCT, thyrocalcitonin, that's PTH, that's parathormone from the parathyroid, regulates the calcium level. So both the hormones are working antagonistically. The parathormone from the parathyroid gland and then what we have calcitonin from what is called the thyroid gland and both are working antagonistically. Calcitonin decreases the blood sugar level and this one increases the, sorry, calcitonin decreases the calcium level and this one increases the calcium level. This one thyroid, parathyroid gland, secreting the hormone parathyroid. So in humans there are four parathyroid glands found embedded on the posterior side of what we call the thyroid gland. Okay, now the hormone secreted is nothing but the parathyroid. So just only one hormone, but this is actually the active form of this, uh, what we call the vitamin D. I'll come this later on. So this is called as a collips hormone. It is a peptide hormone. So it is otherwise called as collips hormone after the person who has actually observed this hormone. So the secretion of PDH is regulated with a circulating level of calcium ions. If the level of calcium ion is low, so the secretion of parathormone is more. If the circulating level of calcium is more, the secretion of parathormone is less. So in such a manner, it is normally secretion is controlled. Now, see that one, there are four yellow brown colored glands found embedded on the posterior side of the thyroid gland. Now these are all on the parathyroid gland. That's the location found embedded on the posterior side. Now what is its function? I mentioned about it is already called as a hypercalcemic hormone. So normally, vitamin D, you know that one, vitamin D is, that is, an, what is called, inactivated hormone. Vitamin D or calciferol is an inactive hormone. So vitamin D is called as an inactive hormone. This vitamin D is converted to active hormone, what is called calcitriol. So vitamin D. So it is inactive hormone, it is called as an inactive hormone. It is being converted into active hormone, what is called calcitriol. Calcitriol. This is the active form, the active hormone of vitamin D. By means of what is called PTH. So the parathormone is responsible for Activating the vitamin D, the inactive hormone into calcitriol, that is what we have, that is an active hormone. This is cal calcitriol, calcitriol, hormone calcitriol. And this hormone calcitriol, once activated, it enhances, that is, uh, that is what is called the vitamin D absorption, or the absorption of vitamin D from, uh, that is, the industrial tract and promoting the vitamin D synthesis in the body. There is nothing with the deposition of vitamin D. So enhancing the vitamin D synthesis by making the absorption of what is called vitamin D from what is called the intestinal tract and that is what we call calcitriol. So anyway now the absorption of vitamin D from what is called the intestinal tract from the digestive food is brought up by calcitriol. This is an active hormone of what is called vitamin D. So vitamin D is inactive hormone converted to calcitriol because of what is called this parathormone. This is what is happening. 
Now, what are the functions? Normally, I mentioned about this is mainly concerned with the bones and acting on one cell. What is called osteoclast cells, the bone. Breaking cells are called osteoclast. So, the bone forming cells are called osteoblast. This is called bone actually destroying cells. So, it promotes the osteoclast, thereby actually promoting the release of calcium by making what is called protein. That is called resorption. Bone desorption is nothing but dissolution of the bone or demineralization removal of calcium. And also it removes the uh, reabsorption of calcium by the renal tubules and increases calcium absorption from the digested food. Like just I mentioned about just now, the absorption of calcium ions from the digested food is brought about by calcitriol. And by absorbing calcium, it promotes and enhances vitamin D synthesis. Now, parathyroid disorder. So when the gland is removed, when the parathyroid gland is removed or actually some disorder in the parathyroid gland, it results in tetany. So, tetany is characterized by one of the symptoms, hypocalcemic condition. In the case of tetany, what we have, that is irritability. And that is what we have, the spasms of the muscles, irritability. And also what we have, decrease the calcium reabsorption by the kidney tubules. And the level of calcium in the blood is low and that is called hypocalcemia. So, one of the symptoms of tetany is hypocalcemia and decreased calcium level in the blood. So, remember that one, hyperthyroidism normally when para, hyperparathyroid, suppose we have for example, now the functions I mentioned about that is one disorder, parathyroid disorder, I mentioned about only that is hypoparathyroidism. When you have actually more secretion of parathyroid, then it's called hyperparathyroidism. When you have hyperparathyroidism, what will happen? Demineralization of bones. That results in increase in calcium level in the blood. That calcium gets accumulated in certain organs like lungs, kidneys, arteries, etc. Leading to what is called stone formation that is called calcification. So in the case of hyperparathyroidism, more secretion of parathormone, what will happen? Demineralization of bones, that is release of calcium in the blood. So, when more calcium is normally circulating in the blood, the calcium gets concentrated, that is in, that is normally in the kidneys, arteries, stomach, etc. in the form of stones and that phenomenon is called calcification, formation of stones because of increased calcium level in the blood. And also because of the removal of calcium, now we have soft areas are formed in the bones, they are called as a bone cyst. So, I did mention here normally, this is low secretion. Hyperparathyroid, this is what is called parathyroid disorder. Hyperparathyroidism results in demineralization leading to calcification and also bone cyst formation. And this is hypoparathyroidism. When the gland is removed or because of just some abnormalities in the gland, we have that is what is called hypoparathyroidism that results in tetany. So tetany is caused because of hypoparathyroidism. Then we have calcification proteins is formation because of what is called hyperparathyroidism, over secretion of the hormone. I didn't have the notes here, but you have to remember. Now the pancreas. So it is called as a sweet gland, a mixed gland, a heterogyne, sweet gland because it secretes two hormones controlling the blood sugar level. It is called a sweet gland. So it is called as a sweet gland, a mixed gland or a heterogyne gland, sweet, sweet gland. A mixed gland, a heterocrine gland. Now, so it is located in other one along with the pancreas, along with the enzyme cells of uh, what is called. This is a mixed gland because it contains both enzyme secreting cells as well as hormone secreting cells. Hence, called as actually heterocrine. Heterocrine means mixed. Okay. Now, the exocrine part produces an enzyme, what is called the pancreatic juice, together, and then the endocrine part is called islet sublime. Now, if you are taking the pancreas, nearly 1 to 2 percent is formed of islet supply hearts. Or in the total weight, 1 to 2 percent. Or we can say number 1 to 2 millions of islet supply hearts. I will come this way now. Now, this is the location. We have this is the pancreas just found in the lumen of the duodenum, containing just what we call the endocrine portion, nothing but the islet supply hearts after the name of the person in islets in a small groups of cells. And then we have also the acinous cells. The acinous cells are acinous cells. They are concerned with the secretion of what is called the enzymes. 
So the hormones are released into the blood and the enzymes are carried by the duct towards what is called the duodenum. That's the nature. Now the pancreas is getting only the islet cell lung horns. It consists of normally three different types of cells along with one more cell I, I given. Mainly three different types of cells. The major cells that is found in the case of pancreas what we call the what is called the beta cells. The major cells found in that one is the beta cells, nearly 70%. The next to it, we have the alpha cells, what we call 20%. The beta cells secrete the hormone insulin, the alpha cells secrete the hormone, what is called glucagon. And also we have delta cells, D cells, the word referring to delta. Delta cells. Delta cells. And those cells normally constitute nearly 5%. They are concerned with the secretion of somatostatin, the one which is suppressed the activity of somatotropic hormone. And also we have F cells. They are nothing but pancreatic polypeptide, nearly 5%. So, the major one, 70%, what we call the alpha beta cells, which is secrete the insulin hormone. 30% of the cells are what we call the alpha cells, which is secrete what we call actually glucagon. 5% is formed by the delta cells which is secrete somatostatin otherwise called as the D cells and then F cells and they secrete what is called the pancreatic polypeptide minor concentration that is not up to the level so that's also 5% cells now this is once again what we have the picture showing so the duct now this is the duct what we call the acidness the delta cell Red blood cell, what we are concerned with the pancreatic acini. This is the whole structure is called concerned with acini, and that is responsible for the secretion of enzyme which open into what we call the duct. And then we have the alpha cell, beta cell, and all together you can see more number of beta cells than the alpha cells, the patches. Now I mentioned that there are about one to two million islet of lanterns. They concern nearly one to two percent of the total pancreatic. Number of islets 1 to 2 million, then their actual contribution 1 to 2 percent of the total pancreas. I mentioned above there are major two types of cells alpha cells, 20 percent. They constitute what we call 20 percent of that one secreting the glucagon, and beta cells secrete what we call insulin, constituting 70 percent of the total one. So I mentioned about the hormone secreted, the alpha cells secrete the glucagon, the beta cells secrete insulin. Now the glucagon. So it is a polypeptide with the 29 amino acids. It's a polypeptide with the 29 amino acids. So responsible for increasing the sugar level. That's why it's called as hyperglycemic hormone. Hyperglycemic hormone. The one responsible for increasing the blood sugar level. So normally it increases the blood sugar level in the following ways. Now the sugar level is maintained by various phenomena. So for example, it may be the following events occur to maintain the blood sugar level. One is glycogenesis. Glycogenesis. This is nothing but the formation of glycogen. Formation of glycogen. Then glycogenolysis. Genolysis. This is the breakdown of glycogen. This is the breakdown of glycogen. So this is the formation of glycogen, this is the breakdown of glycogen, either from the liver or from the muscles. Another one, gluconeogenesis. 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 So there is nothing but actually the formation of glucose. Formation of glucose from non-carbohydrate substance. These are the three phenomena responsible for maintaining the glucose level. Now, the glycogenesis, only one hormone is involved in this process, namely insulin. The hormone insulin is responsible for the formation of glycogenesis. Formation of glycogen. Now, glycogenolysis, it is being brought about by what is called either glucagon, this is one hormone, or what we call thyroxine. Or by means of what is called adrenaline hormone or epinephrine. So these are the three hormones responsible for the formation of glycogen. So for the breakdown of glycogen to form glucose. Now gluconeogenesis means formation of glucose from non-carbohydrate substance other than glycogen. 
either from fat or from amino acids. So glucose being formed, that new source is called glyco, sorry, gluconeogenesis. This is glycogenolysis, this is glycogenesis, and this one gluconeogenesis, formation of glucose from a substance other than carbohydrates. Now this is being brought about by some hormones, what is called the glucocorticoids. 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 Uh, glucocorticoids. So these are all the three events which are all under the control of hormones remained in the blood sugar level. Either the formation of glycogen or the breakdown of glycogen or the formation of glucose from what is called non carbohydrate substance like fats and amino acids. And all these events are brought about by the five different hormones and only one hormone is working against the remaining four. The one which is normally decreasing the blood sugar level is insulin and all other hormones, glucagon, thyroxine, adrenaline and then what we have the glucocorticoids mainly one example, same example of cortisol this is a hormone, one of the hormones of glucocorticoids and cortisol, glucagon, thyroxine, adrenaline all are responsible for increasing the blood sugar level insulin is responsible for decreasing the blood sugar level okay, so these are all the five events responsible for actually that is uh, responsible for increasing or decreasing the blood sugar level okay once again let's continue the lesson now these are the events responsible for just maintaining the sugar level now functions of glucagon as the name implies it is responsible for increasing the sugar level that is why it's called as hyperglycemic heart now what's its main function it acts mainly on the liver glycogen Converting the glycogen to glucose and that process called glycogenolysis. What I mentioned, the breakdown of glycogen to form glucose. And thereby increasing the sugar level. That condition is called hyperglycemia. Increase in sugar level. And also, not only it is involved in the process of glycogenolysis, it is also involved in the formation of what is called sugar or glucose from non-carbohydrate substance. And that is called gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis. This is nothing but the formation of glucose from non carbohydrate substances that is other than carbohydrates like proteins and fats. Now, also it maintains the sugar level, not allowing the sugar level being fallen by just inhibiting the uptake of glucose by the cells. So, it reduces the cellular glucose uptake and utilization. Once it prevents the cells to uptake glucose from the blood, now the glucose is maintained in the blood. Now, and also, it is responsible for the breaking down of fat, thereby actually forming glucose. So, while it is breaking down fat, what we have the ketone bodies are produced. The process of formation of ketone bodies is called actually ketogenesis. If it accumulates in the blood, then it is called ketosis. That is a disorder. Ketogenesis, formation of ketone bodies. If it is not being eliminated, if it is being retained in the blood, then it is called ketosis, a condition of having high concentration of ketone bodies. Now, also it is acting in the kidney and promoting or increasing or accelerating the renal plasma flow, more supply of blood to the kidney. So that increasing the glomerular filtration rate. The glomerular filtration rate, nothing but actually increase in filtration rate, formation of more and more what is called filtrate, that is called GF, or glomerular filtration rate. And also, it stimulates the heart muscles and responsible for the contraction of the heart muscle, that is called myocardial contractility. Now, the functions of insulin. So, insulin was first reported best and banty, best and banty. It is uh, actually a polypeptide chain of 51 amino acids, but it is being formed of two chains. It is formed of what is called alpha chain and then beta chain. Otherwise called A chain or B chain. A or B chain, alpha and beta. So alpha chain of 30 amino acids, beta chain of 21 amino acids. The two chains are being joined together by means of what is called disulfide bond. Disulfide bond. That is only the bond is formed between the sulfur containing amino acids. Now the sulfur containing amino acids are cysteine. Sulfur containing amino acids are cysteine and methionine. These are the two sulfur containing amino acids, cysteine and methionine. 
So a bridge, disulfide bridge is formed between what we call the cysteine residues in the case of what we call the alpha and beta chains. The disulfide bond, what we call a cis bond is formed between the A and B, that is alpha and beta chain, where you have the cysteine residues or the amino acids are present. Now, so that's about what we have actually this one, the role. Now, the insulin hormone normally decreases the blood sugar level in the following ways. One, by increasing the conversion of glucose to form glycogen. Number two, it increases the rate of utilization of glucose by the tissues. Number three, if the liver is fully loaded with what we have glycogen, if there is no place for further storage, now insulin causes the conversion of glycogen to form what is called fat to be stored in the adipose tissue. So these are all the three activities by which normally insulin decreases the blood sugar level, hence called as hypoglycemic hormone. So anyway, it maintains what is called glucose homeostasis, means the equilibrium. So it increases, actually decreases the blood sugar level, unlike what we have the glucagon, hence called as hypoglycemic hormone. Now I mentioned about it acts mainly on hepatocytes, nothing but the liver cells and adipose sites. There is nothing but the fat cells in the adipose tissue. And enhances both the cells to uptake glucose, making them to take more and more glucose. Either from the fat cells or from the hepatocytes of the liver, it stimulates these cells to uptake glucose, thereby promoting the conversion of glucose to form glycogen in these cells. Now it increases the rate of conversion of glucose into fats. So once it is being taken into what is called the liver, it is being converted to glycogen. Once it is being taken into the fat, the glucose is being converted into fat not stored as glycogen. These are all activities brought about by the insulin hormone. All activities result in decrease in the sugar level. So not only that, but also it increases the uptake of what I mentioned, the glucose, and increases the rate of oxidation of glucose in the tissues. When more and more oxidation occurs in the tissues, you know that when the cells are ready to take glucose from the blood, there is uptake being increased. So it increases the rate of oxidation of glucose in the tissues. Now it stimulates the conversion of glucose into glycogen to be stored in the liver and muscles and that is what is called the glycogenesis, what I mentioned in the beginning itself. So in order to that one, maintain a normal blood sugar level, all these events are brought about by insulin hormone. So the normal blood sugar level in a man or woman is about 70 to 100 milligrams per what is called 100 ml of blood or we can say per deciliter. We can either let us say in forms of 100 ml of blood or deciliter of blood, one deciliter of blood. So 70 to 110 is the normal blood sugar level that is being maintained because of the effect of all the five hormones. One insulin, hypoglycemic, all the four are hyperglycemic. Now when there is a deficiency of insulin hormone, the cells are failed to uptake the glucose, so blood glucose accumulates in the blood itself and that is called hyperglycemia. Increase in concentration of glucose that results in hyperglycemia. So, the persistent hyperglycemia results in a disorder towards the diabetes mellitus. The excess of glucose is eliminated along with urine. That is what is called chronic excretion of urine along with a large amount of what is called the glucose in the urine. So, urine, so when more glucose is present in urine, that condition is called glycosuria. Glycosuria. Amount of more glucose in the blood is called as glycosuria. What are the symptoms? The same symptoms as in the case of what we have diabetes insipidus, but we have one extra symptom, what is called polyphagia. This is an extra symptom when compared to diabetes insipidus. Again, in the case of diabetes insipidus, the blood sugar level is normal. But again, the blood sugar level is abnormal. That is the main difference. So polyphagia, the person feels always hungry and eats excessively. The another one, polydipsia, excessive thirst leading to increased consumption of water. Then polyuria, elimination of large volume of urine. So these are all the conditions that are exhibited by what we get the persons having diabetes mellitus. In addition to that one, normally, so we can uh, just we can treat that one what we diabetes because of you know the therapy treatment, nothing but the insulin therapy. Now, not only that, when the hormone insulin is deficient in the what is called the blood. It promotes uh, what is called the oxidation of fats to form what is called fatty acids, which in turn form what is called glucose, thereby increasing the glucose level further. So, deficiency of insulin promotes what is called the fat catabolism, leading to the formation of glucose, along with 
we have the byproduct ketone bodies are formed. These ketone bodies accumulate in the blood leading to condition also called ketosis which is highly toxic to the body causing even some red death also. This is what is called ketosis. This is caused because of ketogenesis formation of ketone bodies. That's normal. When the ketone body is being actually present, that is persist in the blood for a long time, that condition ketosis, accumulation of ketone bodies in the blood, that is highly toxic, causing damage to what is called the brain also. Now the adrenal gland. Now location structure, they are called as suprarenal glands because they are located at the top ends of the kidneys, top ends of the kidneys, hence called as suprarenal glands. As they are found attached to the adrenal, as they are found attached to the what is called the kidney, they are called adrenal, adrenal, attached to kidney. Now each gland structurally, functionally, morphologically consists of actually two different regions. One we have outer adrenal medulla, sorry, adrenal cortex and inner adrenal medulla. And both the glands, so though they are presented together functionally, structurally, Physiologically, even embryologically, these two glands are, these two parts are different from one another. For example, the adrenal cortex is formed from mesoderm. If you are taking the embryological origin, it is formed from mesoderm. And this adrenal medulla is formed from what is called ectoderm. So, that's why I say, though they are present together, embryologically, these two glands are different. One is from mesoderm, another one is from ectoderm, formed. And also functionally they are different, structurally they are different, arrangement of cells also different. So now you see that one, the location at the top end of each kidney, okay, more or less pyramidal like structures. Now if you make a section, we can have what is called the outer cortex and inner medulla. This is the section of the gland showing inner medulla and then cortex and both being different in their morphology, structurally, functionally. I mentioned actually both differ both in morphology and physiology, even in embryology also. I mentioned about cortex from mesoderm and then from ectoderm. Now, structure of adrenal cortex. Here, the cells are arranged in three different zones. Outer zone, which is normally thin, middle zone is somewhat thick, and the innermost one was called relatively thick. Now, the outer zone is called zona glomerulosa. Here, the cells are found in graves or follicles, that is called glomerulus, bunch. The second case, actually the cells are found in the form of bundles, when it's called fasciculate, that is middle thick. In the innermost one, the cells are arranged in the form of network, when it's called red flags. And each region is responsible for the secretion of a specific hormone. For example, zona glomerulosa is concerned with the secretion of hormones concerned with the mineral metabolism, hence called mineralocorticoid. Then zona fasciculata concerned with actually the metabolism of carbohydrates, hence called glucocorticoids. Then zona reticularis along with fasciculata secretes sex hormones, steroids, particularly androgen and more possibly estrogen too. So anyway now these are all the three different zones concerned with the secretion of different types of hormones. Now this is the arrangement you can see. Now this is zona glomerulosa. the cells are arranged in the form of mass and here the cells are arranged in the form of what is called the bundles, that is what is called fascicles. The last one, the cells are arranged in the form of network, hence called reticularis. Three zones. And outer capsule, we have a thin membrane, is also present. Now, hormones of adrenal cortex. Now, the hormones of adrenal cortex are called corticoids. All the corticoid hormones are steroids in nature. All the corticoid hormones are steroid in nature. Don't forget this one, they are called corticoids. All corticoids are steroids. Now, two major group of hormones along with the sex hormones secreted by adrenal cortex. Now, glucocorticoids. Now, these are all hormones concerned with the carbohydrate metabolism. It is a group of hormones like cortisol, cortisone, corticosteroid. So, you see that one, a group of hormones. And the major glucocorticoid is cortisol. The major glucocorticoid is cortisol. These hormones are secreted by zona fasciculata and some of zona reticularis. Major hormone secretion by zona fasciculata and the zona reticularis also helping the, the zona fasciculata to secrete the glucocorticoids. The major glucocorticoid is what we have cortisol. What are the functions? Now, the cortisol increases the blood sugar level. 
by causing the breakdown of fats and amino acids to form glucose. This is what is called gluconeogenesis, formation of glucose from non carbohydrate substances, thereby increasing the blood sugar level. Not only that, this hormone also prevents or inhibits the cellular uptake of glucose by cellular glucose, cellular uptake of uh, glucose. That is why what will happen, the glucose concentration remains in the blood increases. So it is responsible for what is called gluconeogenesis by breaking the fat, that process called lipolysis and also responsible for the breakdown of protein to form what is called the glucose, that is called proteolysis. This is one. So in these two events, normally it normally increases the blood sugar level. Now normally the glucocorticoids are called actually life-saving hormones. All the glucocorticoids together are called life-saving hormones. Life-saving. Because they are providing some immunity against allergic reactions and also during organ transplant. So the glucocorticoids generally called life-saving hormones. Now the cortisol alone called a stress combat hormone. Stress combat. Stress combat hormone. This is cortisol, stress combat hormone cortisol. Because it's helping the body to face any stressful situations. Now, what is its main function? It generates what we have anti-inflammatory reactions at the time of allergies. And also suppresses the immune system during organ and tissue transplants. Okay, these are the two major functions. Generates anti-inflammatory actually reactions during allergic conditions and suppress of the immune system during what is called organ tissue transplants. That's why it's called as stress combat hormone. All hormones together are called as life-saving hormones of glucocorticoids. So cortisol produces anti-inflammatory reactions. What I mentioned generate what is called anti-inflammatory reactions and also suppresses the immune system during what is called organ transplants or tissue transplants. So they are useful in the treatment of allergies and inflammations. That's why they're called as anti-inflammatory agent. Stress combat hormone. So this is the only one which prevents what is called the activity of the immune system while we are doing the process of transplantation surgery. That is while doing tissues or organ transplantation. So that is why it is called a stress combat hormone. And all hormones of glucocorticoids together call us life saving hormones. Okay, stress combat hormone for cortisol. Now cortisol stimulates what is called RBC production too. Erythropoiesis. Now, sex steroids. Now, the zona fasciculata and zona reticularis together secrete. You see that one small amounts of androgenic steroids, the male sex hormones, and also to a lesser extent, estrogen also. These androgenic hormones are responsible for the distribution of what is called hair, the body, the growth of axial hair, the pubic hair, and also the facial hair. If these hormones are more than the normal level, that's when some female, you know that one, we have more hair on the body surface as well as on the face. I'll come to later now, the disorders, hirsute disorder. Okay, now androgenic hormones also secreted by what we have, actually the zona fasciculata particularly, sorry, zona reticularis particularly, along with zona fasciculata also taking part, and that is responsible for the distribution of hair on the surface of the body. Now the mineralocorticoids. Now, these are all the corticoids concerned with the mineral metabolism, particularly the metabolism of sodium ions and indirectly potassium. The major mineral of corticoid is allosterol. It is also a steroid form. Now these hormones are secreted by zona glandulosa. Okay, they are not only maintaining the electrolyte balance in the body, but also concerned with the maintenance of water balance in the body. Electrolyte balance and also water balance in the body. What is the function? So this hormone stimulates the kidney tubules, namely the nephrons, to reabsorb more and more sodium. Whenever sodium ion is reabsorbed, what is happening? Chlorine ions also reabsorb. At the same time, it promotes the excretion of what is called the potassium ions and phosphate ions. These are being excreted out and sodium ions are being actually reabsorbed. So it is responsible for maintaining what is called the electrolytes, the body fluid volume, the blood pressure and osmotic pressure. So blood pressure and osmotic pressure, the volume of the blood in the body and also the electrolytes all being normally controlled by this one. Now, the secretion of what is called 
This aldosterone is another control of what is called renin angiotensin mechanism. Renin angiotensin angiotensin mechanism. Renin angiotensin. Now renin is a hormone secreted by the kidney. I'll come to this later about the kidney hormones. This renin secretion actually converts one substance what is called angiotensinogen. This is the one which is converting this one to form what is called an active substance, angiotensin. So the angiotensin responsible for causing vasoconstriction thereby increasing the blood pressure and also stimulate what we have what is called the aldosterone secretion. On one side it stimulates the formation of aldosterone, another side it causes the vasoconstriction. Vasoconstriction means constriction of blood vessels, constriction of blood vessels thereby increasing the BP. So, now the secretion of aldosterone is because of renin angiotensinogen mechanism or renin angiotensinogen. Now, the renin hormone secreted by one part, what is called JGA in kidney, juxta glomerular apparatus. Juxta glomerular apparatus. So this is a structure normally found in what we have in the kidney, JGA apparatus. That apparatus releases one hormone named renin. So this one is present in the kidney. This renin hormone converts what is called angiotensinogen 2, that is 1, into angiotensin. Once angiotensin is formed, it stimulates the adrenal cortex to release the allosterone on one hand. Allosterone. On another hand, it causes vasoconstriction, that is decreasing the what is called blood vascular diameter by way of constriction of blood vessel. Diameter has been decreased, so the BP increases. Anyway, the hormone, what is called aldosterone secretion, is under the control of renin angiotensinogen mechanism, and that is renin hormone that is stimulates aldosterone, which in its turn doing the activity. Now, that is why you see that when the blood pressure is also increased because of the activity of indirect effect of aldosterone. So, what are the disorders caused because of adrenal cortex? Now, the under secretion of mineral or particles. So, the hypo secretion or under production of hormones, particularly glucocorticoids, glucocorticoids, produces a disorder what is called Addison's disease after the name of the person Thomas Addison. This is glucocorticoids deficiency. Now, what is happening? It alters the carbohydrate metabolism because the carbohydrate metabolism is affected because the cortisone is involved in that process. Weakness, the tiredness of the body, and also fatigue. And the dark, this is the main symptom. The skin color becomes more dark pigmented. That is what's called dark bronze color pigmentation of the skin. More dark color. This is one of the symptoms of what we call generalized albinism. Another one that is Cushing syndrome, this is because of the over secretion of again glucocorticoids. Now the same one also over secretion of glucocorticoids. So over secretion of glucocorticoids or hyper secretion of here is simply given adrenal cortex, mainly in both the conditions glucocorticoids only operating. It over production of ACTH. So either because of glucocorticoids of adrenal cortex or because of over secretion of ACTH from pituitary. Answer would be the same because ACTH only stimulates the adrenal cortex to produce the hormones. The level of ACTH is more ultimately the level of what we have the glucocorticoids more leading to Cushing syndrome and disease. What, <coughs> what are the symptoms? Accumulation of more fat in the body that is called obesity, particularly in the face. So that the face looks like more or less round, circular. That is what's called red bone face, circular. And also buffalo heart. So, accumulation of fat at the back of what is called actually body in the region of back. So, that is called buffalo heart. More fat is getting accumulated. Amenorrhea. This is nothing but absence of menstrual cycle. Amenorrhea, absence of menstrual cycle. Then, decreased fertility sex drive, that is libido. The sex drive, the sexual activity of what is called the male and female normally being stopped or being arrested. Not normal fertility. Normal what is called sex drive. That's called libido. Otherwise, called sex that is called libido. That is being reduced. So this is all because of the over secretion of either ACTH or glucocorticoids of uh, that is what we have. Another one because of over secretion of what is called adrenal cortex, particularly the mineral of corticoids. This is the first two 
neither over or under secretion of glucocorticoids now this disorder is because of hyper secretion of allosterone mineral corticoid that is called cons disease and because of allosterone what is happening bp is increasing the you see that one high sodium ions in the blood and low potassium ions in the blood plasma that causes increase in bp also so rise in blood volume and blood pressure this is because of high concentration of sodium in the blood because it's not being normally maintained properly and potassium level is very low sodium level more more and more sodium is being absorbed and more and more potassium is not excreted out and that increases the electrolyte balance improper electrolyte balance leading to bp also then rise in blood volume and because of the sodium increase in sodium concentration now it suppresses the muscular activity so the muscles become very weak now what are the results of excessive secretion of sex steroids now it causes virilism so appearance of both male and female characters in female or all the hermaphrodite conditions and number 2 presence of what is called hair on the surface of the body and face this is called hirsutism so in female we have virilism and hirsutism virilism development of male and female secondary characters then we have hirsutism the development of hair on the face as well as on the body surface when compared to that is a male now in the case of male we have gynecomastia this is one of the symptoms that is nothing but the enlarged mammary glands in the case of man in the case of man as in the case of female so female we have virilism and hirsutism and in the case of male we have gynecomastia the enlarged breast as in the case of female now the adrenal medulla Now the adrenal medulla is normally formed of epithelial cells, columnar epithelial cells, and they secrete together two hormones, namely norepinephrine, adrenaline, or just sorry, adrenaline or epinephrine, then noradrenaline or norepinephrine, and both are belonging to one group of hormones, what is called catecholamines, and both are derivatives of amino acid tyrosine. Tyrosine is the basic substance for formation of both. now normally you know that one they are rapidly secreted at the time of emergency the adrenal hormones hence they are called as emergency hormones or hormones of fight or flight even also we can add flight so they are called as the hormones of fight and flight or considered as emergency hormones helping the body during emergency situations now what are the functions so the functions are similar to that of sympathetic nervous system because they have the accelerating effect increases the rate of heartbeat And the strength of the heartbeat, and also the respiratory rate is increased. The heartbeat rate is increased. Then the mental alertness. The person is always mentally alert over what is called hyperactivity. See, hyperactivity. Then pupillary dilation. I'll see a strange object, as in the case of sympathetic nervous system. The pupil dilates. Then it makes what is called pilo erection. Nothing but it makes the heart. Normally the heart is placed in cavities in a slanting. So once you are frightened, what is happening? The hair stand on end, and as a result, now that part of the skin being bulged out. That is looking like what is called goose flesh. You see that one when the hair, the pilo erection, the muscles undergo contraction, so it makes the hair stand on end. And also a nodal-like structure is developed at the base of the hair on the surface of the skin, looking like what is called goose flesh. That is called the goose flesh. So it makes the hair stand erect. That is called pilo erection. Pillo erection and also causes goose flesh and profuse sweating. This is because of the fright. One of the difference mechanisms. Now also this is another hormone I mentioned breaking down glycogen, particularly the muscle glycogen to form glucose. There may increase in the blood sugar level along with the thyroxine, glucagon, etc. And once you are frightened, you are unable to drink water or unable to eat or you know unable to swallow anything, either liquid or solid food. This is because the choking, the peristalsis is constant pain. So normally, what is happening causes actually the relaxation of the smooth muscles of the esophagus and the peristalsis to stop. So you cannot drink water, you cannot eat food at the time of frightening, choking. So we can, can say that one, I cannot swallow water once we are frightened, and also the mouth becomes dry because of non-salivary secretion. Because this one also inhibits the salivary secretion, just like the sympathetic nervous system. So peristalsis. Once peristalsis is off, it cannot drink water. It cannot swallow the solid food. This is because of the relaxation of the muscles of the esophagus. 
okay, due to modest power secretion of adrenal limb. These are all the functions. Now, at times, a normal, normal function, this is not the normal function, at times of frightened. Now, the thymus gland, so far this thymus gland is considered as what we call the gland of endocrine, but it is concerned with the secretion of something hormone-like substance, for example, thymosin, thymolin. Now, it is a place of what is called the production of, you see that one, the lymphocytes, the lymphocytes, T cells. Now, it is a low blood structure located at the nose side, the upper side of the heart, and it, so it is composed of outer fibrous capsule, we call the cortex and medulla, and they are producing what is called mainly the lymphocytes, along with that is uh, what we call thymosin one substance. A peptide hormone is also secreted by this one. This hormone is responsible for the proliferation of the lymphocytes and making or educating the pre lymphocytes to form what is called functional lymphocytes, etc. So, thymosins play a major role in the differentiation of T lymphocytes, which provided cell mediated immunity. Immunity provided by the cells. Then, promote production of antibodies to provide humoral immunity, stimulates the B lymphocytes. Now, T cells provide cell mediated immunity. The B cells produce antibodies which take part in the what is called which take part in what is called antibody production, otherwise is called humoral immunity. Now it is normally growing maximum, reaching the maximum size just prior to birth and about reaches about 12 years of age. It is increasing in size up to 12 years of age, after which it undergoes retrogressive involution, the size being decreased in the case of adult. Now, testes. Now, the testes and ovaries are also in addition to the cytogenic function. Cytogenic function means production of the cells, namely the sperms and eggs. They also function as endocrine glands. One, the testes. You know that when a pair of testes located in the scrotal sacs, made up of seminiferous tubules, in between the seminiferous tubules, suppose these are the units of testes, between the seminiferous tubules, we have the cells. And these cells are called Cells of Leydig or Leydig cells or interstitial cells. These are all the, the shaded one is the Leydig cells in between the seminiferous tubules. Now, these are all the seminiferous tubules, the place of production of the sperms. Now, the Leydig cells are the interstitial cells secrete what is called a male sex hormone androgen. The main function of the testis is cytogenic function, nothing but the production of what is called sex cells. In addition, function is endocrine gland secreting the male sex hormone. That is what is called that is uh, androgen. The major androgen is testosterone. It is a C19 steroid hormone having 19 hormones. C19 steroid hormone. Now its main function, you know that when the development of the various uh, organs, that is the particularly the sex organs, embryonic development of the sex organs, and the development of sex and sex, secondary sexual characters, for example, the human voice, the masculine voice, we have the hair the puberty at the time of maturity, the development of physical characters, exposing what we call the second sexual characters of male, all being brought about by this one. So it is concerned with the maturation and functioning of the male accessory sex organs like what we call connected to that one, epididymis, vas deferens, seminal vesicles, prostate gland, ureter, etc. Stimulates spermatogenesis, formation of sperm, stimulate the physical growth of the body at the time of puberty, the various secondary sexual characters, for example, the low pitch voice of me, the development of axillary hair, aggressiveness, what is called the um, aggressiveness referring to what is called the development of secondary sexual characters, and all are because of what we call the male sex hormone. Generally, we can say embryonic development of male sex organs and secondarily development of secondary sexual characters at the time of puberty. So, that is about the male sexual behavior at the time of puberty and that male sexual behavior at the time of puberty is called libido. Produce anabolic effects on protein and carbohydrate metabolism, hence androgen is considered as anabolic steroid. Anabolic steroid. Insulin is also anabolic hormone. Another hormone which is involved in synthesis, anabolic hormone, if they are asking the question paper, insulin one hormone concerned with the formation of glycogen, anabolic hormone. That androgen is another anabolic hormone for anabolic steroid because it's concerned with the growth of the body during puberty, physical development. So anabolic steroid is androgen. Likewise, insulin is anabolic hormone. 
Remember these two questions. Now ovary just like what we have the males present in the abdominal cavity, normally oblong in shape, made up of follicles. The cells of the follicles secrete what we call the female sex hormones, namely just what we have estrogen. This is one hormone. This is what is called C18. Another hormone secreted at the time of pregnancy by the empty follicles is this called the progesterone. This is what is called C21 hormone. And another hormone released at the time of childbirth relaxing. So the ovary secretes one hormone estrogen, then progesterone at the time of pregnancy, relaxing at the time of what is called that is childbirth or parturition. Now estrogen. As in the case of normally male, it is concerned with the development of what is called the accessory female sex organs along with the gonads during embryonic conditions and also responsible for the development of secondary sexual characters. All are given in the form of different things. So females have, you know that one high pitched voice, the males have low pitched voice. The high pitched voice is because of the one. So memory gland development, just the menstrual cycle, the sexual behavior, the growth of ovarian follicles, all being because of the estrogen, mainly concerned with the secondary sexual characters and development of accessory sex organs. Now progesterone, this is what is called anti-abortive hormone or thermogenic hormone or a pregnancy hormone. This is a hormone which is being produced by a transitory endocrine gland, what is called corpus luteum. So after ovulation, after ovulation, the empty follicle will be converted into a transitory endocrine gland, what is called corpus luteum, after the egg has been released. This corpus luteum is persisting only when there is a pregnancy. So that is why during the pregnancy this hormone progesterone is secreted. As it generates heat during the menstrual cycle, this is called thermogenic hormone. As it prevents the abortion of the child during pregnancy, it is called anti-abortive hormone produced by the corpus luteum. So what is its role? Normally maintains pregnancy and without undergoing contraction and relaxation of the muscles of the uterus. It inhibits normally. Keeps the uterus in a cushion state. Cushion state means without showing any movement, without showing any motility. So regulates menstrual cycle, acts on the memory gland, stimulates the growth of the memory glands and the formation of alveoli. The memory gland is formed of units called alveoli, and it causes the growth of the alveoli, concerned with the milk secretion, and suppresses ovulation during pregnancy. Ovulation means the release of the egg from the ovary that is being stopped during the pregnancy period because the pregnancy is going on. Now relaxin is another hormone that is the pregnancy hormone progesterone. This is the hormone that is being released at the time of what is called pregnancy and also at the time of delivery. It, the name itself we see that when it causes a relax, it is a protein hormone not a steroid. So it is normally concerned with either with the relaxation of the ligaments, the pelvic muscles at the time of parturition otherwise called a childbirth. Child, but this other is called sponsorship. Relaxing the muscles and ligaments of the pelvic organs during childbirth. During childbirth. So that's about the different hormones released by the different glands in fluid. Now we have seen already the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus controls the activities of PC. That one, um, that is pituitary, I mentioned about that one. Secreting certain factors, what is called the releasing factors and inhibiting factors. Now these are carried directly to the antipity by means of hypothalamus hypophysal portal system and uh, the portal system is attached to actually the posterior pituitary lobe through axons of its neurons. So the axons are directly connected to the neurohypophysis and now these uh, secretions of hypothalamus are carried to the anterior pituitary lobe through hypothalamus hypophysal portal system. Now there is one substance secreted by hypothalamus what is called dopamine. This dopamine is acting mainly on the prolactin hormone, the milk secretion hormone and inhibiting it. So dopamine is a prolactin inhibitor, prolactin inhibitor, it's a neurohormone, a neurotransmitter also. It prevents the prolactin, so it's called prolactin inhibiting hormone, okay, or factor. And somatostatin I mentioned about already along with the Somatotropic hormone, it is another hormone secreted by hypothalamus which inhibits activity of somatotropic hormone or estrogens. This is not the hypothalamus function, what is it already? The functional areas, the different areas. Now the hormones of heart. So there is also hormone secreted by the heart muscles. 
Now, when the blood pressure increases because of the renin angiotensin mechanism, what I mentioned earlier, renin angiotensin mechanism. Now, we have to decrease the blood, what is called the blood, blood pressure. So, when the blood pressure increases, there is another hormone is being released by the heart. That is what is called atrial natriuretic factor. Atrial natriuretic factor, ANF, or atrial natriuretic peptide, ANP. Atrial natriuretic factor or atrial natriuretic peptide. This hormone is released when the BP is high by the myocytes of that one, the heart atrium. And that one is responsible for the dilation of the blood vessels, thereby increasing the blood pressure is being gone down. So, renin angiotensin mechanism increases the BP along with allosterone. That effect is normally opposed by this ANF. It causes vasodilation and thereby normally decreases the blood pressure. So, it is working against what is called renin angiotensin mechanism. Now, a check on that one. This renin angiotensin mechanism, what I mentioned earlier, renin hormone secreted by the kidney, it increases the BP and that is being normally decreased by the effect of what is called the heart hormone, atrial natriuretic. Now, hormones of kidney, I mentioned about that one, what we have? Two hormones are secreted, one is erythropoietin. The one which is concerned with the formation of RBCs, that process is called erythropoiesis. This is produced by an apparatus, GGE apparatus I mentioned, dextra glandular apparatus. The renin just it is formed by specialized sensitive region formed by cellular modifications in the distal convoluted tubule afferent arteriole and the location of their contact. So, the afferent arteriole and the distal conduit forming a common structure is extra glomerular apparatus secreting two. One is called the renin hormone, I mentioned about the function. Another one about what we have erythropoietin, concerned with what is called the formation of erythrocytes, that is called erythropoiesis. Now, the hormones of gastrointestinal. Now, the secretion of digestive juices are also under the control of certain hormones. They are called gastrointestinal hormones secreted by the wall of the alimentic canal. So, only one hormone is secreted by what is called the gastric mucosa. All other hormones are secreted mainly by the duodenal mucosa. Here is one, gastric. This is secreted by what is called the stomach. Excepting this hormone, all other hormones are secreted mainly is that one, duodenal mucosa. So, mucous membrane of duodenal, duodenal mucosa, another name. Now, the gastrin secreted with the hormone, the gas in the hormone secreted with the stomach epithelium, gastric mucosa. So, epithelium of mucus or gastric mucosa, also called by mastic, gastric mucosa. And this one stimulates the secretion of hydrochloric acid and enzymes, pepsinogen, and then what is called the enzyme by the cells, cheap cells of the stomach. So, it promotes the secretions of gastric juice, including hydrochloric acid enzyme. Now, gastric inhibitive peptide, otherwise called as enterogastro, so otherwise called as actually, sorry, then gastric inhibitive peptide. This is also secreted, all of the hormones I mentioned, the duodenum, it slows down the secretions of gastric juice. And then secreting, this is the hormone stimulate the exocrine part of pancreas to secrete bicarbonate ions along with water to make the solution alkaline. No inhibitor effect, excepting the gastric inhibitor peptide. Then endrogastrone, it is again, it just, it is again, there is no stimulation, another inhibitor effect, just like what we got. This is also some of, both are having the same effect, slows down the activity of stomach, so that the secretion of hydrochloric acid is now, enterocrine, it stimulates what we call the intestinal gland to release the intestinal juice, no inhibitor. So, excepting gastric inhibitory peptide and endrogastrin, all are accelerating effect. Excepting gastric, all hormones are released by duodenal mucosa. Now, pancreas, I mean, again acting on the pancreas to release the pancreatic juice. But this is the person who many times CCK. This is secreted by what we call the duodenal mucosa concerned with the secretion release by, by causing the contraction of the gallbladder. This is the person. Which one of the following CCK? Which one of the following hormone is responsible for the secretion of bile and also the contraction of the gallbladder? So you can have to go through all these hormones also related to. Okay. Now the classification of hormones at the beginning itself, you see that one. What are the Chemical nature of the hormones either peptide or polypeptide or protein or amino acid derivatives, 
can harm the tibia column. That is also very important. Steroids, almost we got the sex hormones, the corticoids, etc. Hydrothyroidine is nothing but the thyroid hormones. And then mechanism hormone action and take the 20 time permits. Otherwise, I'll continue while taking the 12 standard. Okay. So this is the only one left. So we'll take it. That's nearly 10 pages. The next class when starting the 12 standard because we're closing that one today. So anyway, thank you for your cooperation.